Heavenly Father, you have brought us to the beginning of a new day. As the world is renewed, fresh and clean, so we ask you to renew our hearts with your strength and your purpose. Forgive us of the errors of yesterday and bless us to walk closer in your way today. This is the day we begin our life anew. Shine through us so that every person we meet may feel your presence in us. Take our hands, precious Lord, for we cannot make it by ourselves. Amen. Good morning, ladies. I hope you all are having a good morning so far. I hope yesterday was a good day for you guys. Let me just open this up. If I can get it open. There we go. So my phone is having a little bit of problem, so I can't see any of you guys' comments on my phone. So I have my computer in front of me to see. But um, yeah, we're diving into chapter 6 of Esther. It is only 13 verses. And um, yeah, it, it shouldn't be long. It should only be an hour, hour and a half. But obviously it probably will go over that just because we tend to go long. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... For those of you who are new who will watch this on YouTube or later on watching the replay, I do use a Pintel RSVP pen in the fine point, which is a 0.7 millimeter pen. I normally use the black ink, but um, today I'm going to mess around with the blue just because I noticed that a lot of my black ink pens are starting to like bleed through the page. If I can show you like right down here, it's like coming through the page and I don't like that. And um... I guess because it's not archival ink that they will continue to seep through the page. And I didn't have that problem before when I used blue ink. So I'm probably just going to go back to using blue ink pen in this Bible because my other Bible doesn't have that problem. But um, this is the ESV Crossway Single Column Journaling Bible. For those of you who don't know, that is the translation I use when I lead these Bible studies. Though I do prefer the New King James translation. I use the Crayola Twistable Colored Pencils, the Sharpie Smear Guard Highlighters, the Crayola Super Tip Markers, and then I have recently started using the Zebra Mild Liners. So um, I have the Fluorescent Pack, the Cool Pack, as well as the Warm. So those are what I use to highlight and things like that. Post-it notes, of course, I have my large post-it note, which I'm probably not going to be using a large one for a while, but I do have it. It's just blue. Um, then I just have these cute little uh, animal face. So that's a fox. I'm guessing that's a raccoon, and this is supposed to be a sloth. Don't know. Um, got them from Walmart. They're supposed to be, like, emoji-styled. I'm not sure. I don't have an iPhone. So if you guys have iPhones, tell me, are these emojis? I'm not sure. But, yep. That is it. I have my notes ready for you guys. So, what is that? Alrighty then. We're going to read through first. And uh, I think I'm just going to read the whole thing through just because, I mean, verses 1 through 11 is one paragraph. And then you have two verses for the last paragraph. So, I'm literally just going to read the whole thing through. Then we're going to go through in circle and then underline and write notes. If you guys have any questions you can of course let me know but um hopefully this is a better angle for you guys i'm going to try not to mess with my phone at all during the course of this study so that it doesn't zoom back out or mess up or whatever but um i'm calling this study um for chapter six divine providence because this is when you see a lot of uh god's hand in this chapter concerning the jews and mordecai so it says the king's the king honors mordecai chapter six Verse 1, on, the night the king could not, on that night the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of mem memorable, sorry, memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bixana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. Verse 4. Sorry, you guys. I'm a little sick, so I apologize. But um, verse 4. And the king said, who is in the court? Now, Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. 
So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Verse 7, And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Verse 10. Then the king said to the Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the sit square city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Verse 12, Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. Sorry if you guys can't see this. With his head covered. 13, And Haman told his wife Zeresh. I don't know why this camera is shaking. Okay. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and his friend everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. So now that I've done that, oh, that should not be there. Um, What are we doing? Here we go. Okay, thanks, Destiny. I don't know. When I went to Walmart, they came in the package. And um, on the back of the package, it said emojis. I don't know, but they're, like, stinking cute. And I really do like this one the most. It looks creepy, I'm not going to lie. But um, this one is, like, super cute because it has more of a realistic feel. That was so random, but yeah. And again, I'm sorry about the shaking, you guys. I'm going to get this set up officially fixed or just buy a super large table. Because the table I have now is just not working. But now we are going to circle any words that I wanted to define. Um, and these are words that I personally wanted to define. Obviously, you guys would have your own words. Um, where did my nook? Oh, here it is. Because I found a word that I now want to under circle. But I am going to circle the words honor, which is in verse 3. Distinction as well, which is in verse 3. We're going to circle bestowed as well. That's in verse 3. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go to verse 6 and underline delights. I'm going to, I mean, sorry, not underline, circle the lights. I'm going to circle proclaiming, which is in verse 9. And then lastly, in verse 13, overcome. Now, I need to look up honor quickly because I did not initially have that one done. So I'm just going in Blue Letter Bible. Um, let me actually put my light up. So I'm using the Blue Letter Bible app, and um, I'm going to hit verse 3, go to interlinear. And I am going to scroll to what honor. Um, Strong's 3366. Oh, honor is price, value, preciousness, splendor, pomp. It's not giving me exactly what I want. So I'm going to look it up on um, Bible Hub. Because I didn't define honor at first, but now that I'm thinking about it. Yes, the fox and the raccoon are so stinking cute. <laughs> That sloth reminds me of the sloth from, um, what's that movie? Zootopia. 
sorry, the sloth that reminded me of the sloth from Out of Zootopia. Um, where was I going? BibleHub.com. Esther 6 3 is what I want. Sorry, you guys, but I will just give you the definitions for the other ones. So we're going to use the sloth since he's here in my face. And okay, so for distinction. I have that defined. Sorry about the camera shaking, you guys. Ugh. Hopefully it doesn't bother you guys as much as it bothered me as it does with me. But, um, distinction. I think I should move it to the other table. Okay, guys, give me one second to see if I can move this to the other table so it's not shaking as much. So... Bear with me. Move my light out the way. Sorry, guys. <sighs> okay. Almost there. Sorry. I hope that's a little better. It's not going to shake as much because I don't have it connected to my actual desk. I have it to my um, computer desk. So, actually, that looks a little better to me. Let me know if that looks better for you guys. Um, I know the camera does autofocus multiple times when my hand is in it. So, I'm going to move my hand when I'm done. But, um, distinction. This is a brand new pen, so I have to get it going and flowing. Okay. So for distinction, it's the quality or state of being distinguishable, excellent or superior, it's special honor or recognition, and it's an accomplishment that sets one apart. So I'm going to write... Accomplishment... That sets one apart. Quality. Or state. Of being. Distinguishable, excellent, or superior. Okay. I'm just going to look on or up in the English dictionary because it's not giving me anything concrete for the Hebrew so honor I hate working with new pens I probably should have used a black one for today but um I'm gonna open up my Webster's dictionary and type in honor Take a sip of my cappuccino. Respect that is given to someone who is admired, good reputation, good quality or character as judged by other people, high moral standards of behavior. So I'm going to take actually a few of these definitions. I'm going to take the first one, which is respect that is given to someone who is admired. I'm going to take also the sixth definition, which is an evidence or symbol of distinction. Um, so for honor. Good morning, Angela. 
Um, honor is respect. That is given to someone. Who is. Admired. And evidence. Or symbol. Of distinction. That's the only one I had to look up because I actually didn't define that one at first. Okay. Moving on to bestowed. Bestowed is to put in a particular or appropriate place to convey as a gift. To put in a particular or okay so this blue pen is just not working on these post-its okay lovely or appropriate place to convey as a gift delights is a high degree of gratification or pleasure. Proclaiming is to declare publicly, proudly, defiantly. And to give outward indica indication of oh my god I hate breaking in a new pen um, and the last one is overcome which is to get the better of to overwhelm to gain the superior superiority. Uh, why are you not writing a G? Thank you. Yep. Okay. I'm going to go in with my highlighters and as cute as these are, they don't seem to work with my highlighters or my blue ink pen, which is making me upset. <laughs> I think it'll just be easier if I color it in.
Okay. So, distinction is accomplishment that sets one apart, quality, or state of being distinguishable, excellent, or superior. Honor is respect that is given to someone who is admired. It's an evidence or symbol of distinction. Bestowed is to put in a particular or appropriate place to convey as a gift. Delight is a high degree of gratification or pleasure. Proclaiming is to declare publicly, pr proudly, defiantly, or to give outward indication of. And overcome is to get the better of, to overwhelm, or to gain superiority. Um, so that is that. And I'm going to move these out of the way. I do not like being sick. Ugh. It does not bode well with me. Okay. So now I'm going to underline. Starting with verse 1. On the night that the king could not sleep. I'm going to underline that portion. He gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the Chronicles. And I'm going to underline that as well. So just starting off with that first verse is how I'm going to go. And I'm going to use Crayola Super Tips for the first portion. And this orange twistable for the second portion. Okay, so on the night that the king could not sleep. Basically, the king not being able to sleep was not a coincidence. That was God moving things in place for um, Haman's fall and to protect his people. So, I'm going to write, not a coincidence. This is God making his move. To bring down Haman. He gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds. The king basically could have chosen any number of ways to put himself back to sleep. He could have had someone come to play music. He could have had someone bring him a woman. Um, he could have had Esther come to him to go to sleep. But instead of doing that, um, basically God made it so that he would open up the book to remember Mordecai. And um, how Mordecai saved the king back in Esther chapter 2 verse 23 which is a cross reference so um god made it so that the king would remember mordecai And how he saved him. And I'm going to read that, of course, in a second. Saved him. I'm going to write C. Esther 2.23 and also Malachi 3.16. Um, I'm not going to fully box it yet because there's something else I want to write. But um, so Esther 2.23, I'm going to flip back to, uh, nope, it's on the next page. 
Okay, so 223. Um, I'm going to actually start at verse 21. So it says, In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bixen and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on the king. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of Chronicles in the presence of the king. So, he's now looking at this to remember what Mordecai did, and um, I'm going to read Malachi 3.16 as well, because that has to do with the book of what is it called memorable deeds the chronicles um malachi 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 three sixteen reads um then those who feared the lord spoke with one another the lord paid attention and he heard them and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the lord and esteemed his name so basically that's letting me know that the book of records of the chronicles is basically like the book of remembrance where um god put your name when you fear him and um that's where he will remember you so that's basically the two cross cross references i have for that Moving to verse 2. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bixna and Teresh. And um, that's basically what I'm going to write. Underline, sorry, was found written how Mordecai had told about Bixna and Teresh. And um, two of the eunuchs who guarded the threshold who had sought to lay hands on the king. I'm probably going to have to start taking another post-it out because I'm probably not going to have enough space. So, verse 2. I'm going to use this magenta kind of color. Basically, what my thoughts are is that um, it opened directly to the page telling the story about Mordecai and how he saved the king from assassination. This was God basically guiding every single step that night dealing with the king. So, God's guidance for the king to remember Mordecai. And the same cross-reference is Esther 2, 21 to 23. Moving on to verse 3, it says, And the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And I'm going to underline that question. Again, we see God working through the king. He had basically moved the king's heart and at the right time to make a way for Mordecai to be saved from Haman's evil scheme. Sorry about my arm, you guys. Um, and I have a cross-reference for that, but hold on. Let me just write my note for verse 3. Um, God moved the king. at the right time to make a way for Mordecai to be saved from Haman's evil schemes. I do have a cross reference, which is Galatians uh, 6 and 9. But, um, so again, God moved the king at the right time to make a way for Mordecai to be saved from Haman's evil schemes. And the cross reference I have for that is Galatians 6 and 9.
which I'm going to do after I use this color. And we're going to flip to Galatians 6 and 9. So 6 and 9 reads, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Basically, um, this is reminding me that we are to keep persevering when it comes, when it seems that um, it won't pay off. You're not forgotten. You will reap what you sow in due time and obtain a spiritual harvest. Um, and again, this goes back into chapter two when I was saying how Mordecai didn't have to save the king, but he did. That was out of the kindness of his heart. He saved him because he knows the word of God. He knows how God is. He knows the type of God that he serves. So he's saving this guy. And now all of a sudden he has to deal with Haman and his plot to kill all the Jews. And now Haman is plotting to kill Mordecai. And I'm pretty sure Mordecai was probably feeling overwhelmed. It said that he basically mourned. He put on the sackcloth and the ashes and mourned out loud. I mean, even Esther didn't even know what was going on. But um, despite all of that, he persevered. And now he's about to reap the benefits of the good deeds that he did unto the king. Hopefully that just made sense. But um, yeah. So moving on to verse 4. And the king said, who was in the court now Haman had just entered the court, out of court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows. So I'm going to underline who is in the court. Now Haman had just entered the outer court. And then I'm also going to underline to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So I have two parts for verse 4. So again, where it says, who was in the court? Now Haman had just entered the court, the outer court. Again, this is not a coincidence. This is God's perfect timing having that happen. Because as we see in the second portion, there was a reason why Haman was there. So um, for the first portion, God's perfect timing is really all I'm going to write. And then verse 4 again. For the second portion where it says to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. God knew that Haman would be around at that specific time. So he made it possible for the king to be awake to save Mordecai amid Haman's plan to kill Mordecai. God knows what he is doing in the courts of heaven. Um, what? Oh, sorry. God knows what he is doing. Um, and in the courts of heaven, there are no coincidences or surprises. So God wasn't surprised, you know, that Haman popped up at the time that he kept uh, the king awake. There was a purpose behind the king being awake. The purpose was to, one, remember about Mordecai and then to, two, save Mordecai from Haman and prevent Haman from requesting that Mordecai be hanged. Um, and I have a cross reference for that, which is Romans 8 and 28. But, um... God's protection can be seen in his timing with Haman coming to the king. God knows what he is doing and in the courts of heaven there are no coincidences. Everybody likes to say how something is a coincidence, but um, it's just not. It's God's hand guiding you and leading things to where they need to be. Two colors. Uh, I guess these two.
Ezra 4.15. Or which verse, Sonia? Um, I actually did see that in one of my Bibles. I think it was my CSB Worldview Bible. I did see that cross-reference, but I never got a chance to um, check it out. Only because I literally looked up the cross-references about an hour before going live. Because um, I got back a little late from taking my son um, in order that the search may be made in the book of records of your father. You will find in the book of records and learn that the city... Four fifteen. Oh, okay, I see what you mean with Ezra four fifteen. Um, for verse one. Yes, yes. Um, for verse one, I definitely would agree. Um, Ezra four fifteen. I would actually even say starting at verse fourteen. Um, so Ezra four verses 14 to 15 um but yeah that's yeah i definitely would agree yes definitely i just read it that's why <laughs> but yeah because that definitely was in my other bible i just didn't get a chance to flip through it because it, they had a lot of cross references back to daniel and um ezra and i do find thousands of cross references but um when i use the cross references i want to make sure that they pertain and um kind of line up to the context of the scripture because i know a lot of the verses are used multiple times in other parts of the bible but sometimes it's just probably like that one line and then the context of that one line from that scripture doesn't kind of match up with the context of this i hope that makes sense so when i do look up my cross references i do end up with thousands of them but then i narrow them down to make sure that they make sense according to what we're reading but um yeah 415 definitely well, I would like I said, I said I would say Ezra 4 verses 14 to 15 and not all of 15, but like the first portion of 15. My note for this second part of verse 4. Okay, I'm going to read that. So um, basically to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. I basically said that um, it was God's protection. I'm sorry. God's protection can be seen in his timing. With Haman coming to the king, God knows what he is doing, and in the courts of heaven, there are no coincidences. I have it written differently in the printable, <laughs> but when I write my notes on the post-its, um, I write them kind of shorthand. So the full note says that God knew that Haman would be around at, at that specific time, and so he made it possible for the king to be awake to save Mordecai amid Haman's plan to kill Mordecai. God knows what he is doing, and in the courts of heaven, there are no coincidences or surprises. And I do have a cross-reference, which is Romans 8 and 28. And I think I know what this one is, if I'm not mistaken. But, uh, where am I going so far? 8 and 28, I think is that infamous... Yeah, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So, um, again, there are no coincidences. Coincidences, God knows everything, and he is well prepared. He's kind of like a hundred steps ahead of us. So when you think you have one step ahead of God, you're not. He has like a hundred or thousands of steps more ahead of you. So um, skipping to verse 6, because I don't have anything for verse 5. Um... But I'm going to read verse 5. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So going to verse 6. So Haman came in and the king said to him, what should be done to the man who, whom the king delights to honor? So I'm underlining that portion. What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? So I'm going to also underline that portion. So I have two parts of verse 6. And I'm going to write my notes on this side because I have space again. So for the first portion, actually first let me get my colors together. The purple and we're going to go with some green lime green rather 
Okay, so what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? This is God arranging all things so that not only the Jews would be protected, but also Mordecai and then Haman would get what was coming to him. So, um, God arranging protection. For Mordecai and the Jews. Haman said to himself, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Um, I have a cross reference for that and it's Isaiah 56 and 11, which I'm going to read that first before I give my thoughts of what I wrote. So Isaiah 56 and 11. Ooh. Okay, whatever. Let's just go back. Fifty six eleven and uh where'd it go? The dogs have a mighty appetite, they never have enough, but they are the shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each to his own gain, one and all. I'm actually going to read it in the King James translation. So Isaiah fifty six eleven. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough, and they are the sh they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. Um, it sounds a little bit more better in the King James Version than it does in the ESV. But um, basically, God allows man to set their own traps. Haman's pride and arrogance would, would be the cause of his ultimate humiliation. And this was Haman being selfish. He didn't think that there was anybody else that the king could honor above him just because he felt as if he was the king's favorite. He had, you know, uh, a feast, two feasts, not one, but he was going to have a second feast with the king and the queen. So he felt like no one could be above him, especially since he was promoted above the others within the king's court. So... God allows man to set their own traps. I'm going to have to write that on the post-it. Let's use the fox. So, verse 6. God allows man to set their own traps. Haman's pride and arrogance would be the cause of his ultimate humiliation. He was being selfish. And as Isaiah says, kind of like a greedy dog. Um, and the reason I picked that one as a cross-reference is because Haman should have been someone that protected the people, um, especially since he was basically like the second in command to the king. He should have protected the people. As the Isaiah says, um, you know, greedy dogs are shepherds that go their own way. Haman was someone that should have protected people, but because of his own greed, his own pride, his arrogance, he used and abused his power and went his own way instead of following the king. So that's why I picked Isaiah 56, 11 as a cross-reference. So again, God allows man to set their own traps. 
Haman's pride and arrogance would be the cause of his ultimate humiliation. He was being selfish. And again, the cross-reference is Isaiah 56 and 11. And I'm going to specifically say in the King James translation, just because it makes a lot more sense in the King James than it did in the ESV. Um, I'm not sure what other translations sound like, but I just like the way when I, I like the way that it read when I read it in the King James. You're welcome, Destiny. Sorry, guys. Um, I have the comments. Like I said, I can't look at it on my phone because my phone is being retarded. So I have to look at the comments here on Facebook and I have it open, but I have my notes in front of me on the computer. So, okay, moving to verse 7 through 9. Because I have all of that together as like one thought. So for verse 7 through 9, I'm just going to bracket that on both sides. And so we're going to go with this brown color. Okay, so reading verses 7 through 9, it says, And the king's, I'm sorry, verse 7 through 9, And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be sought which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead it lead him on the horse through the square of the city proclaiming before him thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor so what i put was that haman was a bit childish in giving the king ideas because he thought it was for him and to be he thought it was for him to be praised and honor this was him being arrogant prideful and confident in himself he spoke of what he desired and not of what someone actually deserved and I have a cross-reference, which is Proverbs 16 and 18, which I'm going to read in a second. But um, this was Haman being childish, giving his personal desire instead of What one should actually deserve. See Proverbs sixteen eighteen. Um, I'm gonna read the note again, but I'm gonna flip to Proverbs quickly. 1618 reads pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall um this is definitely Haman being prideful um because I'm pretty sure if this was another person of the king if he had another person in mind instead of being selfish and thinking of himself he would not have said you know give this person a royal robe and a, a horse that the king has ridden on and you know have his most noble official walk him through the city and proclaim that you know thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor if it was someone else he wouldn't have wanted that he probably would have said give them money or give them a house he probably would have said something real simple but because in his own mind he thought it was him because clearly back in verse six he said to himself whom would the king delight to honor more than me he felt like he was the best of the best that no one could top him and he was sadly and sorely mistaken for that but um that is that so for verse 10 i feel like Haman is just the ultimate fool like, that's just my personal thought. He is the ultimate idiotic fool because of the way that he thought of himself. Um, instead of really understanding that he was not the best of the best. Okay. So, for verse 10, it says, Haman said to Haman, I'm going to write that note over here. But verse 10, um, it says, Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate, leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So I have a two-part 
um, note for that. So the first part is for hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have mentioned, and do so to Mordecai, the Jew. And then I'm also going to underline, leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So for the first portion of that note, um, it's basically a smack in the face to Haman for the king to have to take his advice but give it to the very man he sought to kill and he came to ask for Mordecai's execution but instead was given a duty to honor that same man he never got a chance to ask for the death of Mordecai and this is clearly God working in this because um I have cross references which I'll get into but um God basically smacked I'm gonna say God smacked <laughs> That sounds so silly, but I'm going to write it this way shorthand. God smacked Haman. By allowing the king. To take his advice. And use it. Or Mordecai. That's the shorthand version of my note because I can't write everything here. And then for leave out nothing that you have mentioned, um, every single word that he said to the king was to be given exactly as he stated to Mordecai. He could not leave a single detail out basically be careful what you say so um i'm gonna write the second portion of that note here for verse 10 he had to honor mordecai exactly as he wanted to be honored and you know this kind of reminds me of like um when you have two kids sorry guys give me one second my fiance just messaged me okay i'm almost done sorry guys i have a photo shoot to do with him today um he's the photographer and i'm the makeup artist so he's letting me know that he is on his way, almost finished. Yeah, so I have to go to his city and we're going to pick up our son about 1230-ish. So, okay, he's just letting me know he was on the way. <laughs> but, um, okay, so for, okay, let, let's get some colors. Ugh, my eyesight is irritating me. I just love color, so I think color just makes everything look more pretty and easier to look at when your notes correspond with a specific color. Okay, so I forgot I had cross references for that. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I'm just going to do an arrow here and write some. 23 and 5 and 57 6 which I definitely will get to those cross ref cross references in a second but um okay so leave out nothing that you have mentioned um he had to honor Mordecai exactly as he wanted to be honored and this kind of reminds me of like when you have two kids um and you have them going back and forth to their mother or their father asking you know telling on each other and then the parent is asking each child what the punishment should be for that child and um they end up getting that punishment for themselves or she ends up switching like the reward so say if one child passes a test um, and the other one says they pass the test and they ask each child what they wanted, she would give it to the opposite child. Hopefully that just made sense. It made sense in my brain when I just thought about it, but <laughs> yeah. So back to the first part of that for verse 10, God smacked Haman by allowing the king to take his advice and use it for Mordecai. The first one I have, which is Psalms 23, 5. 
23.5 reads, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And then 57 and 6. They set a net for my steps. My soul has bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. So clearly in this, you see that um, one, God is setting it up for Mordecai to be well off in front of the presence, um, or rather not even in front of the presence, in the presence of Haman, because he's now allowing Haman's advice to be given to the king, and the king is using that advice to, advice to give Mordecai exactly what Haman said, and he's forcing Mordecai, I mean not Mordecai, he's forcing Haman to give these um, gifts, in a sense, to Mordecai, and also Haman has this plot to hang Mordecai. But that's definitely not going to work out, which we'll see further down um, in the other chapters. But those are the cross-references for that. Yes, um, Tanya. I, I feel like that is a actual scripture, that he'll make your enemies your footstool. But I can't remember what scripture it is. So if any of you guys remember, let me know. And if that's not a scripture, that's probably just something that we all say. Um, but definitely, he definitely will make your enemies your footstool. And that's basically what you can see happening with um, chapter 6 and onward as we continue reading. But, um, okay, moving on to verse 11, right? Yes. So, verse 11. So, Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. All that I have is this for this is that it's the ultimate humiliation. Literally, that's that's the ultimate humiliation. That he now has to praise this guy. And this is the same very guy that he wants to kill, and he's going to kill all of his people. So, for that... ultimate humiliation and the thing about this is God will humiliate you um, and he'll do it publicly without you know care because you are not of his children so he didn't just humiliate him in a f in front of a few people no he humiliated him in front of the whole basically the whole freaking empire like that's just mind-blowing to me how um actually i'm not even gonna get ahead of myself because that's actually a note for verse 13 so i just put ultimate humiliation because that's what it is you had to do this in front of all these people yet he is the one who had the notes written for the jews to be killed Yet he's now honoring a Jew and the very Jew that spurred his wrath against all the other Jews. So going to verse 12. Oh, we're almost done. It's 11.08. Lovely. <laughs> um, so verse 12. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house mourning with his head covered. So I'm going to underline Haman hurried to his house mourning with his head covered. Basically, his pride and his ego were dealt a huge blow that he couldn't deal with. He mourned his pride. He was being forced into being humble through humiliation. He most likely was depressed because, again, mourning is something that you do when you're sad, when you're grieving, when you're depressed. So um, his pride and ego were dealt a huge blow. Pride and ego... Dealt a huge blow. He was grieving his failure, is basically what I'm going to write. It's probably not how you spell grieving. Can't think straight right now, but whatever. That's what happens when you're sick. And we're going to use the yellow. Yes, let's use the yellow. Can you even see this, guys? Okay, you can. Sorry, just 
moving my stuff out of the way. And then for the last verse, verse 13, and Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. And then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, if Mordecai before whom you begin to fall is of Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. And I'm underlining this whole quote. And I have a few cross references for that as well, just two. But um, let me just write verse Okay, so my note for that is basically um, Haman's wife and his advisors could see the future well enough. Haman would not prevail against Mordecai, but Mordecai would prevail against him or over him. Um, it basically hints at the reversal of events to come. God's people will always be protected even when God allows his people to be punished. It's kind of like um, with the whole them being um, with the Pharaoh situation when they were slaves and you know, God allowed for the, the Hebrews, the, the Israelites to be punished. Um, they He put them into slavery for like 400 years or something like that. I don't even remember how many years it was. 40 years? Not 400. I think it was 40 or 70 years or something like that. They were put into slavery. And within that, he protected them. Um, but ultimately, he's not going to allow someone to harm his people within his own punishment, if that makes sense. So he will find a way to keep you protected while still keeping you punished. Um, and at this time, we understand that, you know, the people weren't being pu punished. They were free to leave, but they chose to stay in Persia. That was their option. Um, so I'm going to write this hint again with this pen. Ay, ay, ay. This hints at the reversal. of events to come God's people will always be protected oh my god this pin or is it this posted maybe Even when he punishes them. I'm actually going to put my cross reference here. So the cross reference I have is Proverbs 11 and 5 and Genesis 12 and 3. I'm going to restate my note again for you guys in a second. But, um, I do have my note written here, but it's a little sloppy because this pen is just acting up. So, again, for that, I basically said this hints at the reversal of events to come. God's people will always be protected, even when he allows his people to be punished. Um, and then the cross references I have for that is Proverbs 11 and 5. 11 and 5. Which reads, the righteousness of the blameless keeps away his straight. Now what? I'm going to read it in the King James translation because it sounds better in the King James. Um, so Proverbs 11 and 5. And the Bible that I'm using to read out of is um, this devotional Bible for women in the King James version. It's from Ellie Claire. She's the lady that makes all the pretty um, Bible tabs that I have in my Bible. This is a devotional Bible. It's... Uh, looks like this with devotionals in it, but I've been using this as 
my prayer Bible where I'm going through highlighting the prayers and things that I want to pray. Um, kind of like, let's see. I'm going to actually do a video on this. But like here I have the prayer of Jabaz right here. I have this prayer that Samson prayed. I have this prayer. I think this was Hannah's prayer. I have it, I, I'm going to do a video on this. I don't know why I'm even doing all that. But um, 11 and 5 for Proverbs reads, The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his path. I mean, so, sorry. Proverbs 11, 5. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. Which is the case that happened with Mordecai and, um, you know, Haman. Haman was perfect. I mean, not Haman. Mordecai, sorry, was a righteous man. So his path was perfect. Um, ultimately, he gets a huge reward, which you will see towards the end of Esther. And Haman was wicked, so he fell by his own wicked devices as we see his plot to go to the king for Haman to... Um, oh my god, I'm getting these names so confused. Haman's plot for Mordecai to be hanged definitely didn't go through because he didn't even have a chance to utter the words to the king because now he had to honor Mordecai in the way that he desired to be honored. Um, and then also Genesis 12 and 3, which is about how God protects his people despite being um, when he punishes them. So 12 and 3 is here. It says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And this is um, what was told to Abram. Um, I think this is before he became Abraham. Um, this is what God had told him. And you clearly see this, you know, he blessed Mordecai. And he blessed the king for making sure that Mordecai was taken care of. Whereas Haman now is now being cursed and going to fall into his own traps because he's trying to harm the people of God. But um, that is pretty much it, you guys, for this. Um, let me see your questions. Did you combine... 13 and 14 is there a verse 14 because in here i don't see a verse 14 um actually let me look in here i'm gonna check joanna awesome sis awesome sis it's amazing see okay that see this is a perfect example of why i don't really care for the other translations of the bible because this only goes to verse 13 and you guys can see right here it says verse 13 there is no verse 14 oh sorry i take that back <laughs> verse 14 is way down here so i'm actually gonna read this i i don't like how they have this set up so i take that back you guys i'm actually gonna do verse 14 yeah i see it now destiny but um i will say that there are parts of the uh of scripture which i'm actually going to do a video on my youtube channel and post it in the group um where i'm going to share why i don't like other translations because some of them do take out scriptures um but yeah this one i keep forgetting that it's way down here and i'm not used to that taking place i think they should have just kept verse 14 with that but let's go through verse 14 now why they were yet talking with him and the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to Oh, sorry. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. I don't have a note specifically written for that, but... Okay, see, Angie, I'm not the only one. <laughs> like, you, you would never think to look down here because you would automatically assume that this is chapter 7 because 7 is there. But um, for this... I'm going to underline... Hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther prepared. Thank you for that, uh, Joanna. I totally did not see that. I keep forgetting that they put it down there. So, now we're on to the last one. I mean, I didn't have a note for that anyway <laughs> in my notes. Honestly, I didn't. But I will now that we're on here. So, hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Basically, this is the, this is now the full stage, um, you know, where Haman gets to be front and center. He loves to be front and center. So now God is 
hurrying him up to his performance basically that probably just didn't make sense to you guys um it just made totally sense to what i was thinking in my head <laughs> but um let me switch this back to the edit document there we go but uh god preparing Heyman. It, this is probably going to sound so cliche, but I'm going to say this is God preparing Heyman for his final act. <laughs> that sounds so cliche, but it's the truth. Um, God preparing Heyman for his final act. So cliche, but it's really the truth, as you guys will see, um, because um, chapter 7 is Esther reveals Heyman's plot. So, you know, you can't run away from God, um, especially when you harm his people. You just can't. So there we go. Now we're done. Verses 1 through 14 are completely done. Um, and again, Joanna, thank you for reminding me that there was actually 14 verses instead of 13. But um, that is it. I'm going to show you guys all of the notes. So I have that. Actually, let me put these notes back where they belong over here. That is not sticky enough. So I'm going to have to put some double-sided sticky tape on this note real quick. Sorry, you guys. I want to make sure that my post-its don't come flying out. And I'll just pop that here. And, um, yeah. So, I have this one that has all of my definitions. We have this one here, which is for verses 2 and on. I don't want that to be so far out. And then the cute little fox will go here. Um, so we are done with chapter 6. Next week we get into chapter 7, which has... Why did I just skip a page? Only 10 verses. I'm double checking, yes. Chapter 7 only has 10 verses. Um, I think the longest chapter will be chapter 9. Yeah, but um, chapter 7 has only 10 verses, so that's not going to be a long study. I put the scripture for your foot, so let me check right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. So, Luke 20 and 43. So, um, I'm going to put that on my notes. Which verse is this? 10. I got to stick it somewhere, so I'm going to put an arrow here and just put Luke 20 and 43. I'm actually going to put this, make sure that I write that in my um, printable for you guys. But yeah, chapter 6 is quite interesting. We see the ultimate humiliation of um, Haman, but we also see God's providence over his people. He protects his people. Um, he loves us. He will make sure that there's no harm that comes to us. And we have to just remember to keep pushing through, even when it seems that we're not being remembered because God has the book of remembrance. He remembers us and he will cause other people to remember us. But it has to be at his perfect time and his for his purpose um, and for his glory, not for the glory of man. Um, Haman is the perfect example of someone who was all about the people. He wanted the approval of the people. He wanted the honor of the people. He wanted to be glorified by the people. Whereas... I'm sorry, guys. I don't know why I just interrupted but, um, you know, Mordecai wanted to be glorified and honored by God. So that is pretty much it for chapter six. You're welcome, Stacy. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I'm going to do a video over the weekend. Well, hopefully I can do a video over the weekend. I have a root canal on Friday. Then I have to dance on Sunday. So, I'm not looking forward to this crazy weekend and my mom's calling. She's going to be mad because I can't answer. 
but yep i will answer that in a second i'll call it back uh but yeah i'm gonna do a video hopefully this weekend um about the cling and the john bible study i've already started working on the printables and stuff for cling and i'm gonna start working on the intro packet for john so that i can have the basic stuff up for you guys in june um also, I do have a question. I posted up, um, or rather I scheduled session one for Kling in the video section. If a few of you guys could just look in there and um, in the video section, um, I don't even know if you can, but if you're on your computer, because I know you can't find it on the mobile for some reason, but if you're on your computer, can you look and see if you can see the video for Kling? Because I see that it's posted there, but I don't think you guys can visibly see it until July. So I just want to double check that. And um, yes, Tanya, awesome, awesome, awesome. Listen, you just helped me out this morning because that that is...